SciBite is produced by Jupiter Broadcasting. Hi everyone, and you're listening to SciBite. This is Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast. This is episode 45, and we recorded this one live on May 5th, 2012. Joining us, like every single week, is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey there, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. (laughs) What are we talking about on today's episode? Today, we're going to take a look at how Egyptians are helping astronomical models today, stars being eaten, Strange small contributors, upcoming Venus transit, viewer feedback, SpaceX, say spacecraft update, and as always, take a deep back into history and up in the sky this week. Love that. I can't wait for it. Of course, we had the super moon uh, this week. Did you get to yes. see it? Um, well, there was rain and clouds in the way. Yep. But yep. I, I think I almost saw a, a light in the direction of the moon. There was definitely a bright light behind the clouds. Uh, Maybe. We didn't, it the didn't clouds even, were pretty thick. It didn't even bust above our clouds until about 1045 at night. But I did see some great mm. Seattle Space Needle uh, pictures of yes. it. it looked, oh, yeah. There's all sorts of pictures everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, people online were going crazy with the super moon. Has it yep. always been called the super moon or is that something new that they just kind of branded um, it with? I'd never, no, I'm not really I, sure. It I'd happens every it. year. Right. I know. I like the name, though. I'm not complaining. Super uh, Moon. All right. Well, uh, why don't we do the news? What is our first news story in the week? Egyptian astronomy is actually helping further today's astronomical models. Really? (laughs) Yes. Hey, I guess they're onto something then. Well, they have, you know, some data. Yeah. yeah. Though... Stepping forward in today's time, there is a Algol, a triple star system. It's a, you know, binaries are when there's two stars. And in this system, there's actually a third star located a little bit further out and a larger orbit. And it's got a brightening and dimming period of about 2.8 or so days. So it'll get brighter and it'll get dimmer as the two stars pass in front of each other or behind each other. Hmm. And so the Egyptians who were like, OCD about studying the stars because they, you know, believe that's going to affect, you know, whether you have a good day tomorrow or whether you, you know, should not go out tomorrow because you'll fall down this flight of stairs. Um, So they were watching this and there was a document known as the Cairo calendar. So uh, Egyptians not only were calculating um, that there's two patterns in this calendar that they saw. Okay. One, uh, 29 or so day cycle, which is kind of the moon, and another 2.85 day cycle, which is, they saw this and they, they didn't even know, they weren't looking specifically for what it was. Hmm. So they saw there was something that was going on and it was in the sky. So they looked into the database and they said, hey, what binary star is flickering on this weight, weight, you know, over this kind of time period? And so it got brought back to this triple star system. Hmm. So. What's happening now is that they're using this. They're going back and saying, well... So they matched up their data with the Egyptian data and said, okay, these yes. events parallel what we've observed. So now we can kind of assume based on their observations, they were, they were, we were looking at the same thing. Well, yeah. But not only that, is that their timing was just slightly less. So they had 2.85 days. And now we're at like 2.8, almost 7 Oh, okay. So it's slightly different. Now, because the Egyptians were so OCD about their calculations on these type of things, they don't think it's necessarily error. They think perhaps that this is slowing down because of this third star, it's kind of slowing the other two's orbit down just a little. It's tugging on them a little bit. Yeah, tugging on a little, kind of throwing off, throwing them off just a little bit and kind of slowing the the orbital rate. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And so over over these thousands of years or whatever it is, mm-hmm. I don't I didn't catch the time frame. Uh, yeah. Then it's it's just by just a little bit slowed it down. Hmm. Yeah, and so they're able to sort of check and input this three thousand year old data into their model to give them a better idea of how exactly is go- it's going on and how the three stars interact with each other. Hmm. Fascinating. 
And it's kind of an interesting story of modern day scientists reaching out to their, um, you know, predecessor scientists. Yes. Yeah, there's, it happens. There's um, in Chinese or Japanese uh, historical documents, you know, they'll say any sort of, you know, ancient history, they'll be like, hey, bright star, this time everything was going to go bad. Um, the sky is falling because there's a giant smudge in the sky. And these are, you know, comets. So you can go back and you look at, you know, the, the how often like Halley's Comet comes. Nobody really knew, you know, could identify it before. It was, you know, they knew it was 76 or so years. And they started going back and they're like, oh, look, there's the record going back further in time. And for uh, supernova, we're actually able to go back uh-huh. and see date a supernova and be like, oh, here's where it happened. Because everybody freaked out because there was a huge light in the sky. <laughs> right. And now we can see the remnants right. of that. So you can kind of back into so you can back into the original data and again hmm. plug those into models. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's fascinating too because uh assuming assuming that the original calculations are right, they're able to find out about this slowdown that they mm-hmm. never would have been able to if they weren't so seriously obsessed with with keeping track of that stuff yeah this is over three thousand years and it's <laughs> not that much slowing so it's you know, it's not a time period it would take a little while for us to be able to see that time period you know change and that's not to expect it to be possibly something in the vision mm-hmm. you know within error bars mm-hmm. but that long period of time that we have we're able to actually say yes that is most likely actually slowing down Right. So, we, you know, so it, it brings forward those kind of models so that we can not only use this, but then we can put it to other star systems and be able to more accurately guess what's oh, going yeah, on yeah. there. Sure, sure. You sure. know, so it's, you know, fix the model, you know, tweak it so that it matches up with what we see right. in real life. Right. And then here, and then you can bring it over there and say, hey, yeah, I think that's probably because of this. Yeah. Huh. And, and uh, they'll just keep building on top of that data too. Uh-huh. Well, very interesting. Any other, uh, any other thoughts on that story? No, I don't think so. All right, then. Well, uh, before we go too much farther, I want to take uh, just a, uh, a quick second here and remind everybody. Oh, that's right. Uh, these were like, uh, think, of, think of us as like your handy reminder service that Mother's Day is, uh, is near. And Heather, yes. I realized that uh, I, I always think of Mother's Day in the traditional sense. What am I going to get my mom? Right. Oh. But now I realize, too, that I also need to think, what the F am I going to get my wife? Yes. Mother of my two children for Mother's yes. Day. Yes. Uh, and if I you always, uh, do you have any suggestions, because <laughs> if you do, no, you let no, me know. I always think of, you know, grandparents and yeah. cousins and stuff, yeah. everyone in the family who's a mom. You're like, oh, no, got to at least call them. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, if you're in the same boat I am and you're going to be buying online like I am, you've got a, you've got a couple of more days to do it. And uh, I would ask that when you do it, uh, first visit jupiterbroadcasting.com and scroll all the way down to the very bottom of our site because we've got some links down there. If you're, if you're going to use Amazon US or the Amazon UK, New Egg, Think Geek, Best Buy, Mint.com, Audible.com, Gamefly, etc. Click those links first and a portion of your purchase from the entire session will be contributed to Jupiter Broadcasting. What a great way to get mom something while getting us something. Now, Amazon's trying to convince me that Angela wants a Kindle Fire. You know, well, no. I, I just don't think I don't so. Know. I don't think yeah. so. Uh, I just think if you buy it on Amazon with the link, then you can tell your mom, hey, mom, I am supporting and listening to science-y and techie shows. I'm making my brain smart. Aren't you proud? Maybe I should get her this worm factory. It's a three-way tray worm factory uh, for 80 bucks, and it's Amazon Primable. And if I... If I click that Jupiter Broadcasting link down there at the bottom before I buy this, then Jupiter Broadcasting would make a percentage off that worm factory. Now, she might not love it, but I love that I'm giving Jupiter Broadcasting something. Yes. So uh, thanks to everybody. Jupiter Broadcasting will will get something which will buy uh, Chris a steak to put on his uh, beaten up head. Well, and uh, if you also buy your significant other or uh, your mother a worm farm, uh, when they throw you out on the street, be sure to bring your uh, portable music player so that way you can keep listening to uh, Jupiter Broadcasting shows, of course. You want to think ahead yes. on these things. Oh, Every- yeah. Everybody knows I'll have to, I'll have to be sure to bring my uh, portable recorder. All yep. right, well, uh, thank you everyone for using those links. We do much appreciate it. All right, Heather, it's time for the SciBite News Bite. Yes. 
Now we have Black Holes Munching on Stars. Oh my gosh, I saw this and it, 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 this week and it looks like something from Star Trek. I'm so excited you put it in the lineup. This is great. Yes. This is in June of 2010. Researchers spotted some bright flares, which they thought was from a previously dormant black hole mm. at the center of a galaxy. So over the next few months, those flares continued and they increased in brightness uh, month about a month after it was detected, then kind of slowly faded out over the next 12 months. So then they were able to go back and look at this data that they'd already had and analyze the spectrum of the ejected gas. Ah. So they looked at the specific colors making up the light in the gas, and they Uh saw that it was mostly helium. Now, you know, it was eating a star, but the fact that it was mostly helium and very little hydrogen suggests that... um, it had already been munching on the star for a little while. It had been stripped down to the helium core mm. of the star. Okay. So it was probably a red giant star. About, you know, when it expanded to about 100 times its original radius. You know, when a star like our star is way old, it expands usually. When it puffed up, it became vulnerable to the tidal forces of the black hole yeah. probably stripped off the outside hydrogen layer pretty quickly. Wow. And then, you know, the star kind of orbited around the black hole. And the next time it came in, it came in about 100 times closer. Hmm. So then the inner core was completely gobbled up. So that the brightening was, it doesn't just go gloop, straight into the black hole. Okay. It kind of like, you know, it's pulling it on it just it a little it. bit. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like just it, ripping off it just a little bit yeah, at wow. a time. Wow. So you know, it's munching on that. It's almost like bit it's surely. almost like if it was uh, full of a liquid and it had a shell that was poked and it was spraying yeah. out the liquid, but it's you know, it's instead it's gases wrapped around a, a gravity well. Yeah. That are getting pulled into a stronger gravity well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gravity <laughs> versus gravity, it's incredible. Gravity, the bigger gravity wins. Um, and uh, it. How much of the visuals that I've seen for this, I guess all of them are completely fabricated. None of this... Computer generated yeah. based on data. Right, right, right. Based so on the data that they saw. So the actual textures and, and, and nuances of the image might not be exactly what it really looks like. Uh, no. The, the textures and stuff are, you know, they've put in, they say, for each little bit of mass, there's a pixel. So then, then they'll say, you know, all of these pixels, you know, gather together in a big clump that make a big wave. Ah, okay. So it's kind of seeing that as that's go that's going on. Gotcha. I mean, it it was munched on. I mean, the black hole was probably about three million suns or so in size or weight. Wow. You know, so So that's hefty. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was a hefty guy. He needed a lot of food. <laughs> he need, he needed like, you know, he snacked on the outer layers and now he just needed the munch on the uh the gooey center of the star. Well, now he's going to have that uh, high-pitched uh, helium voice because the very only thing that's left is helium. Yeah, it's gonna yeah. sound kind of funny. That's going to be super embarrassing. Yeah. Really. But, yeah. So, but it was funny because looking back at this data, you know, you could see, you know, the all the flashes, mm-hmm. you know, and measuring the brightness of each flash. Right. They could say, all right, we calculate this much is getting sucked up with each, you know, level of brightness right so then kind of back calculate and say all right well here's the rate that the star's gas was getting sucked in which is partly where the um the computer simulations came from because they can see this is the rate that it was coming in then they can back calculate and say this is probably the size of the sun or the star and likewise in order to get it to go into the black hole at that specific rate that's where they calculate the size of the black hole itself Mm -hmm. So it's like all of this back calculation and data all coming from looking back on some observations from back in 2010. Okay. Wow. Data within the data again. Yeah. Data within data. Because anything like this, you can't predict. We're not quite to predicting this kind of a thing yet. So it's going back and it's looking, you know, maybe somebody goes, huh, that's nifty. Put that to the side with a little sticky note on it. (laughs) And then somebody comes back and says, all right, let's really look at this. You know, the first person, you know, they had their data that they needed and they kind of pushed it to the side with the sticky notes. So somebody else can come and look at it and be like, huh, let's see, what would this match up to? Right. And they start the, the back calculations of, you know, star to black hole and computer animations that look pretty nifty. They definitely do. They look like something right out of Star Trek. Um, yeah. All right. Should we talk about the next story? 
I think so. So when I think of, and I don't mean to offend any of our listeners, but I'll tell you, this is the stereotype that I've picked up when I think of LA. I think of uh, celebrities, I think of traffic, mm-hmm. and I think of smog. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, but you're thinking of cows, aren't you? I am in addition to. Okay. <laughs> What's so, going on? so, you know, number one on the bullseye when everyone sees smog is an automobile right in the center of the bullseye. Mm-hmm. Quack, everyone blames that no mm-hmm. matter what. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it, it's a combination of things with chemistry. Okay. Now, uh, so all a lot of these smog particles are less than about two and a half micrometers in diameter. It's called ammonium ammonium nitrate. Now, ammonia is generated by cars with certain type of catalytic converters and from the bacteria in cattle waste. Right. And then when that reaches nitrogen oxide, um, that's all, like is produced in auto, some auto emissions, then it goes to the ammonia nitrate smog. So it's these, this complicated chemistry going on. You know, and there are factors of cars going on, but there are also, you know, cow byproducts going on. And they're actually able to, you know, measure these things. So they do some low altitude flight tests around L.A. <laughs> in May of 2010 that suggested that um, the cars made about 62 metric tons okay. of ammonium. Okay. And... The cattle made about anywhere from 33 to 176 no six tons way. per day. No way. You're telling me yes. the cattle pollute more, essentially create smog more than the cars do? Anything from about a half to twice. LA has that many freaking cows? Well, there is uh, there's a eastern portion of the LA basin is home to about almost 300,000 cattle. So sort of nearby, but it's just, you know, it's the basin. So it's this big. It blows in. Yeah, it just all falls into the center. So what you're so telling me indirectly tell- is that LA yeah, it- is covered in cow farts? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you fed them better food, then there'd be less cow farts. Oh, right. Now, sure, sure. So that, that's kind of a theory is that you feed them better food, then it would help lower things. And it might help it a significant chunk, not just aiming towards cars. In other words, don't, you know, don't be blinders on for this kind of thing in fact they've seen um that the ammonia emissions from these dairy farms they're very concentrated so they lead up to very high background levels of this type of stuff i gotta tell you this is something else i did not expect to hear this i know it's i saw this and it was was very surprising which i knew some of this but you know it was kind of bring it forth to the table because there is some some data following this and they even it's another story that theorized that the vapors from paint, fumes from outdoor barbecues, even the fresh scent of emitted by trees can all contribute to the vapors that are involved in the chemistry. Now, there, there definitely are you know, vapors from cars involved in the chemistry, but there's a lot of other things that combine to make the smog, the ammonia nitrate. I think Crash Benedict is right. I think next we're going to see a, a cow fart tax and they're going to tax farmers for how much farting their cows do but seriously now yeah let me ask you this okay. at what point do we say okay enough is enough stop feeding the cows corn and things like this that they're not supposed to eat start feeding them grass and things like that because not only is the bad nutrition a bad on the digestive system and causes additional you know uh, output but uh it's also very very hard on their health hard on their bodies and hard on uh the end product it's not as good of an end product um yeah. milk or meat so mm-hmm. what what does it take do you think to to get the dialogue to let's start feeding the cows something else it's it's interesting because there is a, a lot like of politics in it i know there's a lot of politics yeah. You know, and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of FaceTime, easy to blame cars. Mm-hmm. Everyone, you know, they get into the environmental, everyone's just going to blame cars. They don't want to blame the cow. Right. You know, right. Well, they say, and, and in, in a way, there's always going to be easy. more cars out there than there will be cows. So even if right now the cows can outproduce, the cars eventually will catch up. Well, yeah, but the whole point is take as many prong approach as you can. Yeah. Yes, cars need to be right. It's not all the solution. Have better emissions, yeah, right, right? But you also need to look at other things. You know, maybe the cows are contributing. Maybe that leads to, you know, somebody saying, "Hey, let's let's 
you know, the emissions people hook up with the FDA and they all go, hey, maybe we do need to say cows should eat a little bit better. Hmm. Wouldn't that be funny for an environmental reason? Uh, you're right. Though, see, we got to fix cars and we got to fix cows. We got yeah, a lot but, of work ahead of us. Yeah, but that's the trick with science. You don't just say this one thing is what happens to everything else. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the rainstorm that keeps you from seeing a supermoon caused by a lot of different things. True that. True that. It was. Very complex. Very good point. Uh, before we jump on, I want to remind folks that we have uh, the Jupiter Signal newsletter that uh, is, uh, was actually just recently sent out, but I'll tell you a secret. And don't let Angela know that I told anybody this. But if okay. you sign up, there's actually a way to see the back issues, at least for a little while. I don't know if we'll keep it like that forever, but uh, they've all been really good additions. So uh, go over to bit.ly slash Jupiter Signal. Again, that's bit.ly slash Jupiter Signal. And you can sign up and you get our monthly newsletter, which will be coming out later this month. I just wanted to remind folks just because okay, you know. I've forgotten to do that recently. That's okay. I felt a duty to do it. All right. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the two bite news. Oh, oh now we oh. Two news bite? Two. No. Two bite news. Oh. Two bite. Two bite news. <laughs> Were you a cheerleader ever? Because that was pretty good. No. I, I, but you I actually could, said it right. Well. You said it right the first time. I was so I, proud. I read it off the right screen, you see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had to just blindfully push the right button to make the sound cue go off without that's, reading that's it. That's why. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, what is well, our uh, first story in the two bite news? All right. Somebody asked me about this last week, and I'd mentioned it a few months uh, previous, back in March and even possibly back in November, okay. was uh, the Venus transit. is when Venus passes in front of the sun, so we can actually see the little black dot. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, and it's going to happen on June the 5th. That's June the 6th in Australia and Asia. And it only happens about twice a century. So this will not happen again till 2117. Oh, boy. So don't miss it. No. It's going to last about six and a half hours, be visible to more than half of the Earth's surface. And now, you, for some people, it may be you see the first part of it as the sun is setting, you know, or the last half of it as the sun is setting, or you get to see the whole thing. But there are maps linked in the show notes so you can see, you know, from where you are, when to look and where to look and how long you'll be able to see it. Very cool. Uh, so, and in addition, you know, you want to be, so that'll help you get prepared to say, let's find, you know, if you want to watch this, find a spot, you know, in your area or, yeah. you know, is some group going to be doing something? So I will have, uh, I will be able to see it, all, well, pretty much all of the United States. Look at that, right? Am yeah. I reading this right? Uh, so in progress at be, sunset. Yeah, in, at sunset. Yeah. So. Yeah. We're not going to be able to see all of it. And our buddies uh, in the UK will be at sunrise. So we'll see it at sunset. They see it at sunrise. And in Australia, it's kind of going to be dependent on where you are. But for most of you, you're going to be entire. T- you'll be able to see it the entire time. There's the whole thing. That's so, awesome. Yep. So if you you know find a local group or if you're going to do it yourself, then make sure you are prepared. There are glasses mm. you know, to watching anything for eclipse watching is the same kind of thing that you need here. So if you get glasses, make sure they're, make sure they're all sealed, that no sunlight can enter. If you're using binoculars or telescopes, you cannot use those. You have to use uh, specific lenses for that. Even for cameras, there's lenses for that. But sort of start looking at that. And if you're kind of interested in watching it, then you know maybe go over to, to Amazon and kind of look and maybe pick up a pair to, to get to you on time or if you're a big oh, photographer yeah. or something and yeah. you want to do that then use those amazon links if we if you do yeah of course right uh i think i predict there'll be plenty of like of course it's not the same thing i didn't mean to apply this but i think there's going to be a lot of uh you stream and justin tv feeds of oh yeah uh, you know like the people sticking their camera out their window oh uh, yeah you know, that could be kind of just kind of giving the people a, a heads up and when it gets right to then i'll have some more uh right some more data on the show right right after because again that's early june yeah, so, early June, so it's coming up. Yeah, but we'll give you another Actually, warning. I think it'll be uh, the day of a side bite. Oh, okay. Well, that'll be a little rough because people, well, I guess if people downloaded it that day, then maybe they Well, get you know, to, probably yeah. give a, another warning the week before. Yeah, okay. All right, Heather, well, guess what? I've got a little what? flashing red light here on the side bite. Here, let me just... Oh. Oh. Hey. 
Well, according to the SciBite computer, it is time for a little viewer feedback. That is right. This week, I have, looking back into my feedback bucket of information, <laughs> Metal Freak actually submitted a piece of software. Oh, really? It is open source. It can go on uh, Mac, Linux, Windows. Oh, also I know what you're going to talk about. I love this software. Yes. Let's see. Stella Stellarium. Stellarium, yeah. Yes. So it can show you what things like look in the for the naked eye, binoculars, telescopes. Yeah. You can use it in planetarium projects. You know, you set your coordinates, you go. So it was an interesting little piece of the software, open source, so you can just have it right on hand. You totally get go to out. you get to travel around. You can set destination yep. points. You can you know you even go to Mars. You could increase your time. So like, uh, I want to go in real time. I want to go in slow time. Yep. It has this really cool overlay of the uh, constellations that you can put oh, up. Oh yes, and, so you um, can see you know how the modern constellations or ancient constellations, you know, as they've changed over time. Yeah, you know some. Large ones have been broken up into smaller pieces now. See, what I love about this is that it's free and it's open yeah. source. Now, yeah, there are some incredible ones that are available for the iPad and uh, we're oh, yeah. really cool about them. And there's even some for smartphones, but the ones on the iPad mm -hmm. are really great because they're, it's such a bigger screen and you just hold that thing yeah. up to the sky and it basically does like this heads up display yeah. of what's in front of you and it's like you can yeah, explore have a, the universe one of my coworkers had that and he's like hey look and he like looks you know points it out and like points it down into the ground and there's yeah yeah you know what uh, what our friends in australia get to see it's like here <laughs> that's what they're seeing right now right yeah it's very cool uh so yeah definitely check that out and like heather said we have links in the show notes and uh, stellarium you just you just load that up on your machine they got it out there for a mac linux windows so it's ain't no thing yeah. Right? No. Awesome. Well, thank you to Metal Freak. And of course, uh, Metal Freak is also working with me on a new project. Ooh. So uh, people will be hearing a lot more from Metal, Fre Metal Freak in the future. Whoa, we got a spacecraft Ooh. update here. What do we got? Do the SpaceX Dragon Flight. Talked about it last week. Private flight going up to the space station. Yeah, Very yeah, excited. Yeah. yeah. Almost. Oh, no, it didn't Almost. go. It didn't go. No. Oh, what happened? Now they pushed it back to po uh, possibly, probably May 10th. No, possibly, so maybe? Well, this has been moved a couple times now. Yeah. So they're sort of saying, yeah. we're aiming for the 10th, but nobody freak out. So they're trying to set Don't expectations. Don't freak out. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So what happened? Well, it's one of those things, another software, you know, probably something going on. I don't know if they'll actually say specifically. But, you know, they and NASA work together and NASA says, you know, uh, no, we're not letting you uh, come play in our playground if you don't make all these check marks. Right. So they, okay, I got you. So NASA said, no, we want to make sure this is fine. And you have a software problem, you're not, you're not coming up. Yeah. If there's some sort of software, just one little tweak between their systems talking to each other, then mm -hmm. they'll want to push it back. So mm -hmm. There's all sorts of different, you know, they have their own, you know, SpaceX has their own Right. Systems and software. Right. NASA has their own. You got to make sure that they connect in just the right well, way. Well, to be fair, NASA is probably on Windows 98 and SpaceX yeah. was running Windows XP and they tried yeah, to send them a right. .xps file. And of course, on Windows 98, they didn't have the XPS reader. So. And then there's a conversion process and do? something's lost. <laughs> I understand. I mean, space travel is hard. Well, uh, but in all seriousness, I mean, come It'll on. happen. It'll yep. happen. And yep, it's happening. It's close. We just have to wait. May to 10th wait. is Thursday. Yes, it is. So we'll know by next week if they pull this off. Yep. Well, that's not too bad. Oh. No, and hopefully on the next week's episode, we'll be like, they did it. Woo! Because they should they should be back by then too, right? Are they, or are they staying up there for a uh, while? No, they have to go up, get to orbit, hang out there for a little while. Then, if everything's okay, then they're allowed to get near the space station. Mm, right. Then they hang out there for a little while again. And then, they, then the space, then the then space they do station the arm, right? reaches out with the yeah. arm and pulls it in. I'm honestly a little giddy about it. I know. Because it's it could be really a big deal. I mean, I'm not I'm not positive it's a good precedent, but I think it is and I I I oh, I just Yeah. It's a good step. It's, you know, private sector, I'm always a, a big big uh fan of right. and I'm always pushing for that to happen yeah. cuz I think that's That's what's going to get our butts up there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Heather, we'll step over here in the time machine, okay? It's time okay. we All right, here we go. Oh, watch out. Close the door. Close the door. All right, well, our first destination in the time machine that takes us back to this week in science is 119 years ago, May 9th, 1893. What happened? 
the first motion picture exhibition was given by Thomas Edison, Brooklyn, New York, to an audience of about 400 people, the Department of Physics of Brooklyn Institute. Wow. So he's using the kinetograph, uh, optical lantern projector, lantern projector, showed moving images of a blacksmith and his two helpers passing a bottle, forging a piece of iron. Wow. So the film strip had about 700 images. <laughs> Each image was shown for about one ninety second of a sec- second. Yeah. And it was reported in Scientific America in 1893. Uh, you know, uh, in uh, Tim Wu's book, uh, The Master Switch, which uh, uh-huh. is available, by the way, on audible.com, uh, they talk a little bit about uh, the early days in the movie industry. And yeah. uh, one of the things that I learned is that Edison mm-hmm. had such a lockdown on the rights to even display movies that you had to get an event license from him. And so much so that like the, the president of France or something like that mm-hmm. wanted to play back a movie in his own personal quarters. And he had to still wait until <laughs> Edison signed off on the license for him to be able to watch that in his personal quarters. Um, yeah, very interesting, very interesting things about the early days. But that is obviously an extremely historical moment. Yes. Um, very, very, very cool. All right. Well, uh, okay. I do believe our next destination takes us to just 50 years ago, May 9th, 1962. The moon had lasers. <laughs> A laser beam was bounced off the moon from Earth by some MIT scientists. So the area the light beam hit. It was probably about the diameter of about four miles when they hit it. Uh, so it starts off tiny. By the time it gets out there, you know, it kind of dissipates and disperses okay, and okay. Gets, gets to about four miles. So 1962. So they were just trying to, what, get an idea of what the trip was going to be like? Get, well, get a possibly. Feel for it? Yeah. it could be anything from uh, off the top of my head. I don't recall exactly. They could be doing some sort of measurement of the distance. Right. Or sure. if it said students, then I expect that maybe they just did it to do it well it is cool to shoot it lasers there. at the moon i mean well, you know yeah if somebody came up to me and said hey chris would you like to shoot a motor a laser at the moon i i think i would say yes to that yeah i let's, think so let's be fair all right it is time to look up into the sky that is right we talked about it at the top of the show but uh super moon pictures you pr- probably may have seen the "Quote unquote super moon." Yeah. If you didn't have clouds between you and the moon, yep. there we've got some links in the show notes to pictures from around the world, some very iconic locations, including that Seattle one I mentioned, which is awesome. Yes, yes. Mm. and uh, just a note to our listeners: if you had an awesome image, go ahead and uh, send it on in, or post a link to us and send us an email. Um, I'm gonna, if it, you know, maybe it'll go up on uh, that, one of our upcoming shows. That would be so awesome. I would yes. love if people did that. Yeah. So uh, what do you want to do? You want them to email it? SciBite at JupiterBroadcasting.com or put a link wherever they're watching this. That'd probably be best, huh? Yeah. Yeah. That way we don't get a bunch of a Yeah, bunch we don't want huge... to fill our <laughs> box. So I'll say, wait, no huge files. Post a link where you're watching or, you know, email us a link or, you know, to our Twitter. I'm a JB Mars underscore Mars base. JB underscore Mars, Mars underscore, underscore base. base. Right. You can uh, post a link there. I'll watch, keep an eye out for that. So lots of, lots of ways to kind of put in some links to your cool pictures. Oh my gosh. There's just some amazing ones of the freaking oh, yes. Space Needle. It just looks oh, yeah. so awesome. Yeah, that was, that, was a, that was a great moon. I wish I could have seen a little more, but what I did get to see, uh, I did get to enjoy. Yeah. Very much. All right. Is that, uh, is that all for our show this week? Uh, no, we got some look- a little bit um, more, more? Okay. in the sky. All right. All that right. was kind of, you know, what we just saw. I just was but, very uh, taken away by the whole moon thing. <laughs> yes. Uh, Wednesday, May the 9th, the moon's going to rise about uh, midnight-ish. Mm. Stands, uh, you know, due south by the first light of the next day. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we're, that's when uh, the scientists bounce the laser beam off the illuminated portion of the moon right so you kind of see hey 50 years ago today we shot a laser at that and you think they'll come back and say it's moved this much the moon it's moved. well yeah, yeah. the uh the mirrors that they that the astronauts put on there they can they bounce see those it. lasers right. off and they they measure the the distance that it's moved or you know in its orbit mm-hmm. uh friday may 11th venus is going to be dropping a little bit lower in the west northwest every evening as we're moving on uh saturday the last quarter moon's going to rise about the middle of the night. 
And uh, if uh, I included a note this week for any of our uh, deep sky objects, you have binoculars or a small telescope and you want to kind of, you know, push yourself and see if you can find some other things see or you're just interested there. to see what's out there a little bit, you know, more in depth. Explain, than sort of- explore strange new worlds from your backyard. Yes, there's a link in the show notes to uh, a place where you can do that. Cool. Well, now uh, I do believe that yes. is the whole show. I think so. All right, Heather. Well, uh, great show. Thanks for uh, yeah. another wonderful show. Now, uh, should we tease the fact that Sidebite is coming up on its one-year date? I'll just say that. It is. We might do something special. We don't know. We're talking about our plans to see what we can pull yeah. off. So uh, look forward to that. And of course, uh, we mentioned it earlier, but our email address is sidebite at jupiterbroadcasting.com. And uh, you can email us your science questions, your science corrections, your yep. science fascinations, all those kinds of things. We always like to hear all of that. Yep. If you have uh, your area of science and you know your favorite new site, you know, go ahead and send me a link to that and I'll keep that perusal in, oh, in the yeah. list too. Yeah. Maybe some people have some great science news sites and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Always a good one. All right, everyone. Well, SciBite is live on Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv. And of course, then the episode is released shortly after that for download over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. All right, Heather, well, great show. Great show. All right, everyone, well, thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode of SciBite, and we'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>